So we'd like to start with uh, introductions. So um, if you could tell us a little bit about yourself, who you are, where you're from, what makes you who you are. My name is Pamela. I'm, I think I'm going to be 30 this year. I always have to do the math in my head. I never remember how old I am, but I think I'm turning 30 this year. Um, and uh, I see the, the, the go-to things. It's like, what do I do for my job? I don't do anything right now, you know? So I'm like, I'm thinking, what are the things about me? Uh, I don't know. I'm, I'm a big nerd. I like video games. I like to sing. I have two sisters. I have a cool husband. I, I mean, I, I don't know. What kind of information are you looking for, <laughs> I guess? Uh, that, that's, that's perfect. And, uh, you know, video games, any particular type of video games that you like? I'm a big fan of, of stuff that's a little more slow and strategic. So I just had a discussion with my husband the other day because he really likes fighting games. And I just can't do that. They're too fast. They've got a lot of Twitch gameplay. What I like is I like slow stuff. I like tower defenses. I like management sims, like Roller Coaster Tycoon and that kind of stuff. Oh, that's my jam. Um, Great. Yeah. And, and singing, is that, uh, you know, hobby-ish or are you uh, involved with a choir of any sort or, or how do you uh, describe it? Every, every year from when I was in fifth grade to when I was diagnosed, I was in some kind of chorus. And for my adult portion, I was in a semi-professional chorus and we would perform at um, the Kennedy Center in DC, actually. Yeah, it was, it was super cool. Um, and I actually got to do a solo there once, which was very exciting. So, yeah. so you're and, really, really good. That's that's fantastic. <laughs> Wonderful. And yeah, that, so like I'm, I'm, big in, I'm big into singing. I actually, my first year at, at um, college, I was doing vocal performance. Cause I was like, maybe I'll be a singer in some way. And then, and then my mother very sensibly said, don't you want to ever have a job ever? And then, you know, I switched to doing something slightly more practical, but I've always been singing in the background, you know. And that's great that you've managed to keep up with the singing and, and you know, Kennedy Center. That's that's the big show. That's that's yeah. fantastic. Super fun. So, Pam, thank you for taking the time. So so we're here to talk about your health journey. Um, you know, we like to start at the beginning with sort of when did you first realize that something might have been wrong that you that you thought that maybe you should uh, seek some some attention? So it's weird because it wasn't when I noticed something was wrong. It wasn't at all related or it didn't seem at the time like it was related to my eventual diagnosis. Basically, what happened is I think it's, it's got to be two years ago now. This is, I think, year two of dealing with all this. Um, basically, it was a very hot day in July, and we had just dropped uh, the car off to get the airbag replaced because of some factory recall or whatever. And my husband and I were walking to a nearby cafe or something, and I hadn't had anything to drink. And so I was, it was very hot. I was very tired and I ended up uh, actually fainting as we were trying to walk to this place. And that freaked my husband out a lot because women in my family, in a very unhelpful way, when we faint, we tend to like twitch as if we're having a seizure. And it's very frightening for people who don't know what's going on. And there was like a nurse walking by and she was like, she's having a seizure, call 911. So my husband's like panicking. And then they get there and I'm you know, by that time I've come to, they poured water on my head. I'm like, ah, you know, this is fine. I have a history of fainting. I've got like vasovagal syncope. I faint, I faint all the time. This is not a big deal. It's because I was hot, whatever. And they're like, yeah, this sounds like it's just because you, you were hot and you didn't have anything to drink. Just be careful the rest of the day. It's fine. And that seemed fine. And then um, that was the right before the 4th, 4th of July weekend of that year. And then that Monday when I woke up to go to work, felt weird. Basically, I had like tingling in my extremities and like I was kind of maybe a little bit nauseous and my head was fuzzy. It was just all around sort of bad feeling, but in a very vague way where I couldn't really tell what was going on. But it was vaguely bad enough that I was like, we should probably go to some kind of doctor to see what's going on. So we went to urgent care and urgent care checked all the things that they can check. And they said, we have no idea what's wrong with you. Please go to the ER and give us $100. And I was like, great, thanks. And so then I went to the ER and they checked a bunch of things. And they said, well, you know, it probably isn't, but it could be a blood clot in your lungs. And I was like, that sounds very spooky. So they said, well, yeah. we've got to do, we'll do a CT scan to check for that. And so then they scanned and they're like, well, there's no blood clot in your lungs. And I'm like, that's great. And they said, but you know, what is in your lungs is a bunch of weird little nodules. And you know, that's, we don't like that. And I'm like, I don't like it either. And they said, well, you know, usually when people have CT scans unrelated 
nodules will just show up. A lot of people get nodules for whatever reason, you know, and, and, and I had had pneumonia as a kid. So I was like, it could just be scar tissue from the pneumonia. And they said, yeah, probably, but we'd like to check it out, you know, a couple of weeks down the line, just to see if they're still there or whatever. So I was like, okay, fine. And then for the next couple of weeks, I was just like, fine. And then I went in for a follow-up CT scan and they scanned and like, they said, well, you know, all the nodules are still there. And I said, well, I didn't think they were going to disappear. It's, this gives us no information. And so then my doctor at the time said, well, you know, I still don't like them. So we're going to go send you to have a PET scan, you know, where they inject you with radioactive sugar and whatever, you know, science stuff. And I was like, at this point, sick of doctors telling me to do stuff. And I was like, oh God, we have to do this really? But I did it. Cause you know, what are you going to say? No. And so I went and I got a PET scan and they, you know, scanned everything and they said, well, the stuff in your lungs, it doesn't light up the way that bad spooky stuff lights up. And I was like, great. And they said, but you know what did light up? A big old thing in your colon. And that just, I was like, what? <laughs> and so what? it was at the time we, it was it was rolling around to the end of August at that time, and um, I was going to go on a, a trip to the beach for my birthday. And so the Friday before we were leaving for that, they scheduled me for a colonoscopy. So I had to do all that stuff where you drink a bunch of Gatorade and sit on the toilet for an entire night and have a miserable time. And then so literally right after the colonoscopy, we were leaving to go on this beach trip. So my friend was over and my husband and sh she and my husband were both in the waiting room and, you know, they do the colonoscopy as they do. And then they, they bring him in and they said, well, you know, you guys are about to go on, on this little beach vacation. Do you want to, should you, we could tell her she has cancer now, or we could wait until later. And he was like, excuse me. And I was like, what? And he was like, well, you better just tell her because. As if, as if he could have not like, as, yeah, as that's if he not made that obvious, just like, you no. Know. And so then we ended up going on the beach trip anyway, after I like, you know, cried for an hour. And then we were like, okay, now time to go on the beach trip. And I remember what my husband said, and it was like the most genius thing in the world. And I would say it to other people if I, if I was in the right position, he said, okay, you have cancer. Do you want to have cancer here? Or do you want to have cancer at the beach? And I was like, you know what? I would love to have cancer at the beach. And then we went to the beach and we had a great time. <laughs> wow. Well, no, that is, a, he, he sounds like a very wise individual. He is, um, he's a fantastic person. <laughs> and so from the time, uh, you know, you first fainted and, and you said you had a history of fainting and you mentioned a word, uh, vaso oh, yeah, vasovagal syncope. That's the fancy science term for a lot of people. If you know, a lot of people get kind of icky about needles and medical stuff. But if you like, if you're, you know, getting a shot and getting the blood drawn and you get like lightheaded, nauseous, maybe faint, usually that's because it's triggering your vagus nerve, which is basically like the, the restart button on a computer where your body just goes, oh no, emergency, press the restart button, you know, and it, you know, it's, it's kind of like almost like a fight or flight kind of thing where it's like oh no danger must play dead and reset the whole body only it's overreacting to you know medical stuff so that kind of thing i had always had an issue with getting shots and seeing other people in medical scenarios so i'd fainted a couple times before so i didn't think it was anything weird that i had fainted again and the time from from that initial uh, fainting episode to your birthday how, how long was that and so, so to because um the the fainting episode was like right before 4th of July. And then my diagnosis was like August 31st. So mm -hmm. my primary care physician, I don't know why he had bad feelings about, cause I, when they saw the nodules in my lungs, I said, hey, that's just scar tissue from when I had pneumonia. It's not an issue because I felt fine. You know, I certainly would have, wouldn't have pushed for more scans or whatever. But my primary care physician, physician Dr. Brian Sinisi, I don't know if you're allowed to say his name or whatever. He's now moved to a different practice, but like he, he knew, <laughs> pardon my French. I'm going to, oh, I'm probably going to probably gonna come out. Worry, but yeah, out. <laughs> just, he pushed for it because I guess he had a bad feeling and he was right. So like, I'm so thankful and impressed at how, how quickly things got done. Cause I know, especially if someone is young and doesn't have any other sort of symptoms going on that kind of thing can easily just be like pushed to the side or oh you know it's probably okay you're young it's probably nothing we're probably fine but he was he was very thorough and he wanted to make sure he explored all the avenues and well 
I never would have known because I wasn't having, you know, traditional colon cancer symptoms. Uh, it was crazy. Sure. So, so you get the diagnosis and clearly it's, it's a, a, a very difficult thing to hear. Yeah. Oh. And then you said you, you cried for an hour, which I mean, I don't think it was actually an hour. I think it was more like I cried for 20 minutes and then was like continued being sad for another 40 minutes. And then we started going to the beach and I got pizza and, you know, that ma pizza made everything better for at least a little while. Uh, no, I, I was actually going to say the opposite. It sounded like you processed this heaviness fairly quickly. Um, I and mean, then, you know. it's, it wasn't like a okay, I've cried about it, now I'm done. It was a ongoing process of remembering what was going on, being sad about it, recovering from that, getting a new piece of bad news, being sad about that bad news, adjusting to that, a sort of just an ongoing, every time a new piece of the puzzle arrived, just trying to process it and incorporate it into, okay, I guess this is just how life is now. And so you went on, on this fantastic trip um, what was sort of the next step and, and did you have enough information or were you gathering information at the time? Um, I mean, other people who weren't me were gathering information. So uh, after we got back from the trip, um, basically they were, they, it was, it was then inf information gathering phase where it was like, you know, we have to do a biopsy of some surrounding lymph nodes because, you know, if it's just in the colon, then we can just go straight to surgery and get it out and that would be great. And that's kind of what we assumed would be the case because I was so young and not having any symptoms, but they um, did a biopsy of a lymph node. And um, I remember I was at work uh, actually when they called me and they said, well, it's in the lymph node we biopsied, which means you have to do chemotherapy. And then I was, you know, crying in the stairwell at my office. Is it part of the ongoing process of getting a new piece of news and having to process it and stuff. And so, um, and then it was a matter of um, checking to see other places where it might be. So I actually had like a lump in my breast that I didn't know about. And so there was at one point a question of whether that was something. So I had to get a, you know, a biopsy of that and having a needle stuck into your breast isn't fun for anybody. Unfortunately, that was just, that was nothing, but you know, it was just a, I had to, I had to get it checked. And so there's a lot of checking. And then once everything was checked, sort of the, the plan was, okay, now we do so, such and such sessions of this kind of chemo. And then at least there was like a plan in place. And so uh, you, you were formally diagnosed in August. And, and uh, when did you start chemo and how long did that take? I think it was, I started chemo like late September. Okay. Like it was, it was a, again, very quick turnaround. Once I got back from my little beach trip, I did all my biopsying and then they were like, okay, we know it's here and there and let's go for it. And had you, had you told many folks? Um, of course, your husband knew, your friend knew, but, but anyone else I in mean, the family? Perhaps? I think my, my memories of the immediate aftermath are a little bit fuzzy on account of me not being in a great brain space at the time. Oh. But I'm pretty sure that I either texted my sister about it or my husband disseminated the information to like my sister and my mother. Um, I mean, my, my parents knew that I was getting the colonoscopy. So I, I think, I think we told them like that day. And then um, my older sister, who's been like amazing throughout this whole thing, I'm pretty sure she was in charge of the phone tree where she was like, okay, go to the beach. I'm just going to tell everybody. You don't have to worry about telling people. I called your dad. You call, okay. My husband called my dad, my, my core family members, dad, sister, they sort of told other people so that I wouldn't have to. Sure. Sure. And, and, and that probably took a lot of, um, because you know, you might have struggled with how to say it and you might have struggled it's, with it's weird. The one of the only one of the only people that I actually had to like come out and tell in any formal capacity was my boss. And so I whenever I told him, I actually I, I started crying because it was like the, it was the first time I had had to like emotionally like present that information to somebody else because it had all been taken care of. Fortunately, my boss at the time was great. He was like just very sympathetic and like hey, we're going to do all the stuff we can to help. I've got some people who work with cancer that I'm friends with. We can talk to them and stuff. But I just remember like walking into the, his office and being like, hey, I've got some weird things to tell you. And then I just started crying. It's like, mm. ah, nut. it was nuts. But yeah, that was one of the only but emotional conversations I had to have about it because the rest of it was taken care of. <laughs> which was very good. And, and that's so great that, that that you felt comfortable enough with him to let him know and he he was, was supportive. And that's yeah, it was, so a great, it was a great office. 
you know, the 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 pandemic downturn meant that they had to kind of furlough and or very nicely fire a few people. And since I was already like part time doing a lot of medical stuff, I was like one of the first on the proverbial chopping block. But it was like it was the nicest way I think anyone can ever be fired is how I was let go from that job, you know, because it wasn't really firing. It was like, hey, when stuff picks back up and when you're feeling better, we'd love to take you back. So okay. no, that great makes sense. And it sounds like it was just sort of an agreement. Yeah. yeah. So um, chemo, uh, it can be scary for some. Um, <laughs> certainly the side effects are, are there. Um, could you describe your experience and then maybe with what type of chemo that you were you were doing? Uh, yeah, I started off with um, full fox, which is a which is like the standard go to for metastatic colon cancer. And it's um, a platinum based chemotherapy. So um, it doesn't, it has some of the sort of traditional things you think of as being the chemo side effects of like nausea and vomiting, but it also has its own like special side effects. Cause you know, obviously when people think of chemo, they have like an image in their mind, but all chemos like are different and they're all different medicines and they all have crazy different things that they do. And one of the weird things about full Fox is it makes you sensitive to cold. And I started it, you know, in you know September, so I was I was doing it throughout the winter. So basically, I I when I was on it, I couldn't like touch things that were colder than room temperature, or it would hurt my fingers and would make them like numb and tingly, but also painful. And I couldn't drink anything that was colder than room temperature. Um, I never tested this, but apparently if you drank things with like ice in it, it would feel like you were choking. And I was like, I'm just not even going to try that. I'm just going to stick to warm liquids, which made it kind of hard to hydrate because you're just like, oh, I have to drink some mildly warm water. Um, but yeah, so the most it was it was dealing with um, nausea and being tired. So I was getting it um, biweekly in infusions that were like, I don't know, two hours long. And I would sit in the chair for two hours and then I would get carted home with this little weird pump still attached to my body that I had to carry in like a little fanny pack. And then basically for the next two or three days, I was totally knocked out. I would be lying in bed, uh, taking anti-nausea medicine and sleeping. And my husband would just be anxiously sitting outside and probably not eating dinner because he was too worried. And I also started getting nosebleeds more often because, you know, it wrecks all of your mucous membranes. Some people get like mouth sores. I didn't really have that issue. But it was more like a nose thingy. And even now I have just kind of a perpetual runny nose, just kind of I'm always wiping my nose now. Um, and, and I haven't been doing that chemo for you know months now. It's just like a and, a, and I had um, the the numbness and tingling in the fingers. That's a thing that um, platinum based chemo does. And even after I stopped that chemo, I actually had to stop that chemo because it was doing too much nerve damage. And I had started to get numbness and tingling in my fingers and toes. And we switched to a different chemo because of that. And I've been off it now long enough that, that it's called neuropathy, peripheral neuropathy, uh, like, you know, outside nerve death or whatever. Um, it's basically gone by now, but that was another thing that I had to deal with. Sure. And, um, you had been on the full Fox for how long, uh, how long were it did, did like, I think, nine or 10 sessions of it. Usually people are on it for eight to 12 sessions and uh, sessions are bi-weekly. So I want to say that was like six months or something. I, mm. The math, the math is wrong there, but it's some, some, something like that. And then um, I'm trying to remember the order of operations. I'm pretty sure I was on it and then planning to switch to a different one. And then I ended up getting a, a blockage so one of the fun things that happened when I was diagnosed is that doctors told me, you're not allowed to eat anything that's high fiber or leafy vegetables or a bunch of different specific vegetables because, yeah, because specifically colon cancer, it's a big thing in your intestines. And so if you stuff that has fiber and leafy vegetables bulks up your stool to be gross. And so, you know, your way is narrowed. So it's like, don't eat stuff like that which is really frustrating because like all of the things when you Google, it's like, what should you eat if you have cancer? It's always like eat lots of whole grains and leafy vegetables and healthy things. And I literally wasn't allowed to. So I was just having to eat like white bread and a bunch of garbage. And even though I was doing all that in um, January of 2020, I had an intestinal blockage and I had to have uh, emergency surgery for that. 
and uh, now I have a colostomy bag. So I instead, uh, I shit out of a hole in my stomach. Sure. Sure. So that was an interesting and thing. And then after that, I switched to a different chemo and I did that for a couple months. Well, I guess I did that from like February to September of 2020. And then I switched to a, a clinical trial that is um, some, uh, some corporation is trying to develop a medicine specifically for people who have colon cancer, whose tumors have the specific genetic mutation that I have. Because whenever they do a colonoscopy and get a bit of your tumor or whatever, they send it off and you can say, hey, yes, test it for all these weird genetic things to see what kind of tumor it is. And so fortunately enough, they um, they were doing a, a clinical trial. Literally it's 20 minutes from my house. So oh, yeah. like, I don't know how much, you, I don't know what your health thing was, but in mean, like the cancer zone, people, there's sometimes people, you know, have to do a clinical trial and it's states away. They'll be like, getting on planes every other week to go and get treatment because you know the only place that's doing a clinical trial for their specific thing is in like Arizona or whatever and just I don't know how I could be so lucky that they're literally doing it in my backyard so I could just drive there and then drive back you know and it takes me like 15 minutes and and now I'm on um, a I'm that I'm on that experimental sort of drug, which is a pill that I take, and uh, we're seeing what that does. Okay, and and how long has it been since you've been enrolled in the study, and were there tests and things that you had to do to to qualify? Yes, there were lots of. So I've been I've been enrolled since I I, I remember this again because I I first had the meeting with the doctor who's in charge of the study on my birthday last year. My birthday is just like now, like my cancer anniversary. That's the new day it is. But um, so a little bit, af a couple weeks, maybe a month after that is when I was properly enrolled. And there were a lot of like screening things in advance. Like you had, they had to um, do a lot of tests, make sure that it, you know, wasn't spread to certain other places. Like I had to get a full body bone scan because they were like, you know, oh, if, if it's metastasized into your bones, then you can't do the trial. And uh, they had to check the lung stuff and like make sure that was actually migrated from the colon thing and wasn't a different kind of cancer, which it might have been, which it wasn't. It's just migrated stuff from the colon. And then I had to, in addition to being like screened where it's like, if this test comes back this way, you can't do the study. I also had to have a bunch of like initial benchmark tests because obviously they're trying to um, see not only if this drug can do the thing they want it to do, but what kind of side effects it's going to have. So like they scanned my eyeball and did an echocardiogram. And then whenever I get off the study or uh, get better or whatever, they'll do another one of those to see it's like, okay, you've been on this drug for this long. Are, are your eyeballs still working the same? You know, And they'll check to see if it has other effects on the body. So there was a lot of screening, but there was a lot of also like just getting benchmark information before I got on there so that they could then track the progress of whatever happened to my body. Sure, sure. And are you allowed to, to, to mention the mutation, the specific mutation that you... Um, you I mean, you it's, uh, I think it's the, um, it's the KRAS mutation. That's the, um, that's the one where if you have it, then there's a lot of drugs that don't work for you. So, you know, it's the fun one that makes things more difficult. Yeah, and, and, and those therapies are, are just being developed now. So that's great yeah, to, yeah. to hear that that uh, you were <clears throat> able to access the clinical study. Is it is it because where you are, there's a, a, an academic center nearby or a teaching hospital? Or, um, or I just like, there's just like a cancer center nearby where they just, I guess, do various um, trials. Because I know that the trial I'm on isn't the only one that's going on there. So I think they're like the headquarters for a couple different trials. Okay, that's wonderful to hear. And, and again, that it was close by is such a, such a great thing. For real. So have the doctors told you sort of how you're doing? Um, have you experienced progression at all? Um, um, you know, I haven't experienced any progression, capacity. fortunately, knock on wood. My initial chemo, when I was on full Fox, it did a really good job of shrinking and killing the stuff that was in the colon specifically like that stuff as far as we know it's basically dead down there and the main thing is that the the nodules in the lungs are still around they're not they're not big enough to be really scary but there's a lot of them and they're still there so um the so far all the i've gotten a couple different a couple ct scans since starting this trial drug and the lung stuff hasn't gotten any smaller 
but it hasn't gotten any bigger either. So my my magical thought in my back of my head is like, maybe it's already dead and they're just not going to get smaller because it's scar tissue. But you know, we don't know that for sure. So sure. basically we just want to, for now, we're just staying the track because I'm, I'm, res- I'm not having any really terrible responses, you know, side effects of the medicine. So as, as long as I'm not, might as well keep on it, see if we can get stuff to get smaller or at the very least not get any bigger because that's be, a stable scan is a good scam. And yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And so it's um, been over a year. Um, how do you feel today? And, and, and how do you manage through? Today specifically? I figured you meant in general, in general. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm doing well. I'm, I'm very, very fortunate to have a super supportive social environment. You know, I've got awesome parents and two great sisters and a fantastic husband. And the the pandemic was, you know, a weird wrench being thrown into the works. But almost it was like, I feel like it was probably easier for me to deal with the pandemic than most people. Because it's like, my life was already just like totally upheaved. So it's like, oh, now it's just slightly more upheaved in a different direction. And we, we, we live in this house with two roommates who are technically our landlords and it's my high school best friend and her husband. They ba- they bought a house and then the house has this sort of accessory structure that we rent from them for like cheaper than any rent you could possibly get in this area. And we all like, since we're part of the same household and they're very sensible and safe people, we just, you know, hang out together. Like we ordered dinner tonight and we're like, so we're going to eat some mini corn dogs and hang out, you know, that kind of thing. And my, my day to day is like just pretty, pretty great. Like if... I, my, my, my husband likes to say, our life is awesome apart from the cancer part. It's like, yeah, it kind of is, you know, apart from that, you know, putting that aside, everything else is kind of just going nice. No, and that, that's great to hear that you have so much support. Yeah, and, the, and the support, like, I, it's, it's difficult for me to imagine how much harder it must be for people who don't have the robust support system because that's made everything just easier. Cause I've got my, my older sister, she just like, I don't know where she found these people, but she's just, there's just like a, another team of doctors and nurses that she just sometimes talks to and will like text me and say, oh, have you mentioned this type of therapy to your doctor? Or you should email these people and get some extra testing done for a thing. And, and you know, then I've got parents who are very emotionally and financially supportive because obviously there's some, I don't have a job anymore. So that's like a whole thing. And, and then my friends are great. Everybody's just great. And that just makes it so much easier to do everything. Sure, sure. And and um, it, it is, uh, you know, you, you handle everything with such grace and I can feel sort of your energy and, and you know, sort of sounds like you're, you're powering through and it appears to me that you're powering through extremely well. You know, what sort of advice do you have for folks who, you know, encounter such a, you know, some would say a, a difficult situation for sure. And, and what do you tell them sort of to help them to power through their own journey and how do you sort of infect them with the optimism that that you you so clearly have part of it is being okay with not being okay sometimes because obviously even now i'll still sometimes have days where it's like it's almost as if i've forgotten for a while that i have cancer and then you know i don't know i'll be going to a doctor's appointment or something or I'll think offhand about some spooky statistic that I read on the internet. Here's here's advice number one. Don't Google statistics. They are not helpful. They're not going to, there's, there's good Googling and there's bad Googling. And Googling statistics of like survival rates, specifically if you're in any kind of medical situation that involves that, don't Google that. Statistical information is about groups. It has nothing to say about how you as an individual are going to do. And it's just going to make you miserable. So don't do that first of all. But if you do do that, it's okay to be sad about it. Because if you're having some kind of health crisis, it's a big fucking deal. It's something that's going to affect your day to day. And it's okay to be sad about it happening. And even if like other stuff in your life is going great, like mine, you know, there's sometimes an extent to which it's like, well, I'm so lucky in all these ways. I have this great support system. You know, there are people who have it so much worse than me. I shouldn't be sad about it because it's like, no, that's don't try to play like comparative sadness Olympics where you're like, I'm not allowed to be sad because other people have it worse. You experience your own life. That's all you've got to go on. 
And if something shitty happens to you, it doesn't mean, it doesn't matter how many shitty things are happening to other people. You are allowed to be unhappy about it. You are allowed to mourn whatever, you know, even if it's just like, ah, uh, I have this dumb medical procedure and it means I can't go to Cancun this weekend. It's like, okay, you can be sad about that. Sure, it's like a first world problem, but it's still a problem and it's a problem you have and you can be sad about it. And, you know, ac accept that being sad about it, but like, you know, it's, it's don't dwell in it. That's, I mean, that's easy enough to say. It's hard not to dwell in it if you're having difficult stuff going on. But if at all possible, then once you've accepted that sad feeling and you've let yourself feel sad, think about the things that you can feel happy about, even if they're small or silly. And anybody who's just getting sort of the initial news of a medical difficulty, whether it's cancer or whatever, something that you're, you're just now learning about, understand that that initial time, that first few days, that first few weeks, maybe few months, that's the worst time. It's, it's when it's hitting you the hardest and you don't know what to do and there's a lot of uncertainty. And basically after that, it just gets better. Because even if, even if the medical stuff doesn't get better, you, it's, not, it's, it's gonna be easier for you to manage because you've had time to work through it and time to make plans about it. And that, that initial awful feeling is not how it's going to feel the whole time. It's going to suck a lot in the beginning and it's going to get easier as it goes on. Yeah. Well, no, that's that's fantastic advice. Um, uh, you know, accept where you are. Don't dwell on it. The statistics are are not bad numbers. You don't want to look at them. Sure, sure. And um, and uh, you know, having the support right that you've had, and um, you know, your your appreciation for your sisters and your husband and your parents, uh, it comes through. Sounds like you're in in a great situation with your friend who who also lives with you as well. You know, uh, it it sounds like you are are managing through in in literally the best way possible. So I want to congratulate you on on you know succeeding in the way that you are. Um, staying optimistic. It's infectious. I'm, I'm feeling it myself. So thank Yay. you so much for, for, for sharing the, the optimism and the enthusiasm. And I'm sure it's going to inspire others. I'm absolutely certain of it. I, I sure hope so. so. So Pam, I wanted to thank you. Thank you so much for sharing your story. It'll send you the link. And, and from then on, whenever someone wants to ask you about your journey, you, you'll have <laughs> just, the... I'll be like, I don't have to say the whole thing again. I can just link you to my little video. <laughs> yes, like, there you go. All right, there cool. Well, okay. I think I'm gonna go eat dinner then, because I'm. Uh, yes. I've got a I've got a uh, a salad with fried chicken and some uh, some corn dogs. Phenomenal. So I am <laughs> jealous, and uh, I'm gonna go try to figure out what I'm gonna eat for dinner. So thank you, you so do. much, Pam. Take care, and um, I'd love to stay in touch. So thank you. Oh yeah, much. for sure. <laughs>